the advice I would give myself, I would tell them to break free. And for me, it's basically to not be shy and be confident in the ability that you always had. And I would call him the nerd. And because the word nerd for me is an acronym. It's never ever realized defeat. I'm Dan Baum and you're listening to Redefine You. Join us as we continue to explore what happens when we're challenged to change our thoughts, beliefs, or even who we think we are. How do you go from shy and uncertain to confident speaker and leader? In this episode, we hear how Kevin Lemus, a student in AACC's construction management program, did just that. We also speak to Forrest Kasky, a professor in both academic literacy and interdisciplinary studies departments, about the importance of community. First, Kevin's story. Hi, my name is Kevin Lemus, and I'm a student here at Anne Arundel Community College studying construction management. Well, welcome, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. You have an interesting story of how you came here to ACC. Tell me a little bit about that. I, uh, so during my uh, time at high school, uh, I was always trying to um, see what I wanted to do after. Uh, during my senior year, I would always think about colleges to apply to. I applied at Embry-Riddle Embry University, as well as Capital Tech here in Maryland and Tennessee, Tennessee Middle State, and I got accepted to all of them. Mm -hmm. I also got academic scholarships from them, ranging from 10000 to 12000 each Wow, a semester. Great. That's great. But something in me was like, I'm not good enough to go to college. I, I struggled with confidence, and I never believed in myself, never believed in my ability. Although I had family members always saying that you could do it, you can do it, I felt like they were obligated to say that to me. Mm. So during once I graduated, like two days later, I got my first job. And then a month later, I got my second job. And during this time, I would still have that inner battle with if I wanted to go to college or not. Was I good enough? Once I got those calls from Miss Cassandra Moore telling me, when am I going to apply for classes? I would always give her the same response to be like, oh, I'll do it soon, but I would never do it. And then it would be a recurring thing almost every week. She would call me up until it was sometime in August where she asked me, she called me. This call was different. She said, oh, can you come in for a breakfast? I was like, sure, I'll come in for a breakfast. It was different, but I'll come in for a breakfast. Hey, free food. Okay. So once I came in, I was told that um, I was going to receive a scholarship. And wow. in my head, automatically, the first thing that I said was another academic scholarship. No, no different. But what stood out to me is that when they were explaining the scholarship is they said that someone believed in me. They wanted to invest in my future. Those words stuck out to me because I felt like someone else that is not family actually believed I was worth investing time and money into. So what did that feel like when you heard that, knowing that someone else who didn't know you believed in you? It felt great. Like, it was a feeling that... Then, like, I can't even explain it. It was just so wonderful to feel that I felt warmth run through my body. It was just an amazing feeling just to know that someone else believed in me. What do you think held you back initially, given that your family was being supportive, you were getting some scholarships from other schools? What, what was it that was holding you back? It was my confidence. I was never confident in anything, uh, even though I was doing good in school academically. It's just I never really believed in anything I put out was great. I felt I could have done better. I would second guess almost everything. But I guess that had to range from the, the things I've had gone through in the past that actually destroyed my confidence, such as my uh, father, um, my mom and my father separating, mm -hmm. and then my mom and my stepdad separating as well. And it just destroyed me, it destroyed me, destroyed my confidence, and a lot of people asked, how did it destroy your confidence? It was basically saying to me that if they left just like that, I wasn't worth anything.
once you got here, what challenges did you feel you faced or how did you overcome those challenges? The challenges I faced was to actually break out of my shell, to actually know that I had a voice and just project it to people and know that basically saying that I'm here. And I struggled with doing that, but once I actually started taking my first class, the first thing I told myself is that I want to break out of my shell. Let's put it all forward, no, just taking one step at a time, just put it all on the line right now. And every time I did a presentation, I was loud, I was enthusiastic, and I was proud about my work. So some kind of a switch really flipped yeah. when you learned that you had somebody backing you. Yeah. That's fantastic. There must have been some risks involved in coming here. If you weren't confident before, what did you feel? Were there some risks? Uh, the risks I felt were, was I going to actually do as well as I did in high school? I heard that college was hard. And I also heard that the stigma of community college is just like 13th grade. Were people going to make fun of me? Were people going to, you know, judge me? I had actually a couple of friends stop talking to me because I was coming to a community college. Really? Yeah. So that sounds pretty risky. How did you handle that? The one thing I always did was that when people actually stopped talking to me, I would always think it was for the best. Because a lot of what I've heard before is that if people weren't there when you were at your low, they don't deserve to be there when you're at your best. That's a great perspective. Yeah. What about helpers on the journey? Do you find you had some, obviously right in the beginning, even the director of admissions, yeah. Cassandra calling you, but then after that, do you have other helpers that have helped you along the way? Uh, I would always have to say, not regarding school, but my mom, my mm -hmm. sister, they were always supportive. They were always supportive of my decision on what I wanted to do. Of course, they always wanted me to come to college, but they were always there to say, look, if college is not for you, don't go. So I had that support. And once I actually came here, I had a lot of support. I just met, I met Miss Cassandra, Miss Janice Watley, Professor Forrest, Pablo, Sam. Oh, I, the list goes on and on. I just had a long line of support that literally if I needed anything and one person wasn't available, I had like a line of people that I could just go and just talk to if I ever needed anything. So you have a lot of interaction with other students. Yeah. What obstacles do you find that they're facing? Do they echo some of the things that you experienced? So what I've experienced, what I've seen is that every student is different, but I get to see a little bit of me in them. A lot of people uh, that I see are shy. They are shy presenters. They are shy to do this. Basically, I, I see myself in some of those people that are shy to present. And I just, I get to, I, it's basically like seeing a mirror. It's just, I see how I just talk to them. At one point I talked to this person, they said that I was so shy to present. I was like, what you feel inside is not projected on the outside. And I told them that. And then like two weeks later, I saw the student again. And they were like, you know, that advice you gave me, I kept on to it and it actually made a big difference. I got a B on my presentation. And, and it was the highest grade I've ever received on a presentation. That's excellent. And clearly, you're in such a great position to share that with other students. It's very authentic because you've experienced it yourself. They must really relate to that. Uh, recently, uh, actually, it was like around Christmas time, I went to my high school. And I was sharing my story. I was sharing how it is to be in community college. And the one thing I've always gotten was that community college, my parents don't accept it. And I said, and the one thing I always told them was, who's going to the college? Is it your parents or you? Right, good, good question. And that's the philosophy my, parent, my mom always gave me. She said, I'm not doing it, you're doing it. It's for your benefit, not mine. And, uh, and when I was sharing my story, a lot of people would just sit and look at me and it would be quiet. And then I would get a few students to be like, how'd you do it? And I said, I just one day woke up and took a leap of faith. And they said, really? And I was like, yeah, that's all you need. You just need to believe in yourself and just jump.
Someone believed in Kevin and a switch flipped in his mind. Warmth and confidence replaced doubt and uncertainty. In an incredible transformation, he broke through his shell, found his voice, and unleashed his enthusiasm. He took a leap of faith. One of Kevin's helpers was Professor Forrest Kasky. In addition to teaching, Forrest is involved in many activities, all with the common theme of building connection and community. Let's talk to Forrest about why he feels those themes are so important to his students, himself, and the community at large. How long have you been at AECC? And tell us about your role here. Uh, this is my fourth year, so three and a half years, um, and I am an academic literacies professor, which is um, developmental reading and writing, um, but I also am in the gender and sexuality studies department, so I teach um, American studies, LGBT studies, and pop culture. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about developmental courses. What, what exactly are developmental courses? Typically, developmental students um, are uh, kind of sometimes considered to have some sort of learning disability, but I've found that most of them actually do not have a learning disability. A lot of them have just had something happen in their life to where they've missed out on a little chunk of their education, which makes them like a successful reader or successful writer. And so we get them to that level. I meet with them five hours a week. In the first two to three weeks of the course, um, it's team building, getting to know each other. I'm establishing sort of trust with them. And then we work on, we read personal essays by like Malcolm X and Gary Soto and, um, and other people who just really write from the heart to talk about their struggles and how they learned how to read or write or got into school later in life. So they're connecting academically and they're connecting um, metacognitively and they're connecting with me and with each other. So they start writing these personal essays, so I, I mean, and they start pouring their hearts out on, into them. And so this one student, she's brilliant, and but she's like, my brother was killed um, in a drive-by shooting wow. when I was a sophomore, and I couldn't focus on school. And she's like, says that when she reads, she starts to drift off and think about that, mm. and that she just couldn't pay attention in school, but she wants to. Mm. And so when that happens and I start directing them into like counseling and getting students enrolled in the SASP student achievement and success program here on campus. They are a conduit for students to go into all kinds of service programs. Mm -hmm. So th that was just one example was that student, but it's, it's not unique. Yeah. I'm curious how you help them overcome these different challenges. So when it's a major life event like that, you mm -hmm. might direct them to other resources and services. Are there other ways that you help them overcome some of these challenges? Um, let's see, because we're together five hours a week, and a lot of these students have major trust issues with school. Um, they haven't either bonded with a teacher or they're poor testers, um, so a lot of them have test anxiety, mm. so they've always just been, feel, I guess, kind of victimized by the system. But they start to establish relationships with me, with other people on campus, like with their SASP advisor or tutoring center, um, but also with each other. So they're making these friendships, and I always... I actually have a little PowerPoint of myself and my friends because um, when I was a freshman in college, um, I still have the same core group of friends from my freshman year of college. So I'm like, the people you meet in this classroom might stay with you for life. And I, right before I came here, I checked the roster for my um, uh, one of my classes, and it's two girls who became best friends in my 040 oh. class, and now they're in my 101 class nice. coming up in the spring. And so they become accountability partners, and mm -hmm. they start to get on each other to come to class and do the work and, and, and focus, and so that really helps them as well. So this is not all that you do here, though. You are a faculty advisor, you're involved in clubs and things like that. Tell us a little bit about the other areas that you're involved in. Sure, so I'm the one of the faculty advisors for the GSA, which is the Gay Straight Alliance. Um, it's a club with, it's growing actually, um, usually about 30 to 40 people come to the meetings and they're, they're, held, they're held for two hours once a week. And they do events about once or twice a month. They're very active. Um, and then I'm also the faculty advisor for Sigma Chi Epsilon, which is a um, honor society for developmental students. So once they leave the developmental program, they go, and, and if they reach a certain um, grade point average, then they're part of this honor society and it stays with them for life. So what, what drew you to get involved in these different groups? Um, 
Well, the GSA is very personal. You know, as a queer faculty member, um, I remember being in college in the 90s, right like after or during towards the tail end of the AIDS crisis. So when I was coming out in the early to mid 90s in New Orleans, um, all the people that I met were were dying, basically. Hmm. And so it was a very sort of weird time to be coming into gay life. So kind of scary, I would think. Yeah, it was very scary. Yeah. yeah. And so when I went into college, um, we were fighting for visibility. We were fighting for um, attention from the government um, for um, money to go to this crisis and also just to being treated like a like a basic human being. Um, so I wanted to so when I so then when I became um, a, uh, a faculty member, I kind of wanted to give back and sort of uh, put myself back into that into into that club into that environment and what challenges do you find that students face that you interact with in that environment as opposed to in in the developmental classes well in that environment they're they seem pretty secure in their education they're they're mostly struggling with space so one thing about AACC is we're not in a city you know, we're, we're more or less in like a small town suburbs of Annapolis. There's no gay clubs, no gay bars, no queer community centers, mm. which is where those of us who are from cities, um, where we go to for safety. So for these students, AACC is their place to feel safe. Um, so that's why the club has a large um, amount of people, large amount of members. Um, also, uh, they hold a lot of events because they hold dances and they do a drag show and they have parties and fundraisers. And so this is a way for them to have their community, which is this campus. Um, so when they go into the community, because it's not a city, they don't always feel so safe expressing themselves and being who they are. Um, but this campus is more of like more or less a safe space for them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes students will uh, p- and their cars change from one gender to the next and then come onto campus and then go back to their car and change into the gender that their parents or community thinks that they are and then go home. Hmm. Um, being part of community is safety. You have people who watch out for you. You have people who really do genuinely care about you. And um, that is why I'm here. I just, I, I really enjoy being a part of that matrix clearly you're placing safety as a priority putting that first how did you arrive at that is so paramount i think just from hearing their my students experiences um i know that at least one or two of my students each semester is either homeless or becomes homeless at some point Hmm. um in the semester so that was a, a big sort of shocked to me. Hmm. Um, I would think so. Yeah. And for various reasons, um, so a lot of students get kicked out for their sexuality or gender identity. Um, that's a huge thing. Of housing. Of where housing living. From their parents. Their parents wow. either kick them out when if they come out or if they discover wow. that they're not who they want them to be. Um, sometimes a family member might lose a job. Mm-hmm. And so when I started noticing this happens, it was because students would disappear. And I know that happens to everyone, you know, all of us, our our students disappear throughout the semester for whatever reason. But I would call them on the phone and try to reach out to them. And if I was able to make that connection with the student, then they would pick up the phone and maybe explain to me what was going on. And so then after being here with time, at, at the college with time, I started to I sat down with Tiffany Boykin um, one day. She oversees um, a lot of the student support services and mm-hmm. things. And I was like, what do we have to, for these students? I really want to give this message to them because I keep noticing that this happens. It's, it's, it, I feel like it's an ep- epidemic. Um, so she started telling me all the resources that are in the community that we have here on campus. And so I just feel like it's my job to communicate to the students these things. When you talk about community and safety, were there certain people that helped you to create uh, safety for yourself or a community that you found? Yeah, growing up, I you know I had a single mom who worked two jobs, 
and a sister and a grandmother who also worked. So I was the typical latchkey kid. You get off the bus and you had a key and you go home and you have to make dinner for the family and started working when I was 14. <clears throat> so, and then worked full time all through college. So um, I didn't have the traditional go to college, not work and live in the dorm situation. Mm-hmm. I had to work full time throughout the whole thing. And actually I, w- I went to community college in between all that as well Mm -hmm. to get some to kind of figure out where I was going. I was a a film writing major and I met a biology professor at community college because I was trying to take my biology prerequisites and um, he just kind of, I don't know, took me under his wing. I don't know what it was he saw in me, but he really sort of um, opened my mind to other avenues in college so I was always afraid of science Mm -hmm. but I started to love it because of him and I got back into I got back into school full-time working full-time so he was one example of sort of what happened to me but it was like college professors college staff um, and then people in the community at the jobs that I was working who really helped me out and sort of transformed me from this like New Orleans kid from a lower middle class environment to where I am to going up to New York to college and then to where I am now. We, we, we've heard this theme of asking for help a lot and the people that I've, I've been speaking to. Do you find that to be a challenge for the students that you work with? Is they're not willing to ask for help or they don't know how to ask for help? Oh, exactly. Yeah, completely. They either don't, I don't think they know that they can ask for help. And I don't think a lot of times that they think that they can trust the person is actually really going to help them. Um, <clears throat> there's, I mean, countless times when I try to send students to writing centers or t- um, to the literacy lab, they're like, I, they say, I don't want anyone reading my paper. I don't trust them. So I hear that all the time, all the mm-hmm. time. Um, but once they start interacting with more and more people on campus, they start to realize that they can start to trust people. It's a slow process for some of them, but they can start to trust them. With all that you do, I, I feel like saying, wait, there's more, because you're also involved in other activities too, like the intergroup dialogue. What exactly is the intergroup dialogue? Sure, the intergroup dialogue is, um, <clears throat> it's a group of faculty and staff members. Um, we get together about once a month, and we just have very frank, honest discussions um, about privilege, but not necessarily always explicitly explicitly about privilege just um, sometimes we'll focus on race so it gives people a chance to talk about their experience as a white person or as a person of color Um, a lot of times students come and it just gives people a chance to be hurt to speak and be heard and to listen and just learn about each other's experiences we seem to be in a very polarized period right now what happens when you have those dialogues it's a, a lot of times very emotional people the per- the dialogue sort of conjures out a lot of emotions from people mm. and it doesn't necessarily get political um it's more just personal so mm. it's people just saying this was my experience for example as a black woman and uh talking about what their experience with racism is and just and the day-to-day life and sometimes these experiences cause a lot of anger um, sometimes a lot of sadness. Um, I rarely leave one of these conversations without crying in public or in my car on the way home to Baltimore. <laughs> you mentioned students participate sometimes. So what do they get out of being part of those dialogues? I think a lot of times they've never explicitly talked about these issues. Hmm. Um, a lot of times people don't explicitly talk about race. We're not supposed to talk about race. It's I think a lot of people are afraid to talk about race because they're afraid of saying something offensive. Um, and there was also sort of a uh, mentality that an I don't see color mentality that existed for a while. Um, so people just didn't talk about race. And it's also very painful to talk about race. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just saying race right now. But uh, we talk about social class, other things. Um, but I don't think people really talk about these issues with people who might have a different opinion than them and people from a different background than them. Mm -hmm. I think it's really easy for a lot of um, 
like-minded white people to sit there and talk about uh, that the struggle that black people go through um, because we're going to get a, we're, we can talk about it. But when you're actually presented with someone who's just you can sense them, smell them, see them, hear them, who's right next to you. Um, actually telling you about their experience, then it's way more visceral. And students usually leave feeling pretty emotional and usually wanting to do something. Hmm. So they, they, want, they want to act. Well, you're obviously a very busy person. So what keeps you going? What, what motivates you to do all these different things? Uh, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, coffee and I just, I don't know, I love the work. Um, I'm really good at managing my time. Um, I always worked two jobs most of my life, so I'm used to working really hard. Uh, so, but also just love the work. Like I love teaching. Um, I love w working and interacting with students, especially the students that we serve. Students who sometimes need a little extra love um, and someone to understand them. So, I, I just feel like in a way that it's my calling that to do this, and and I really love it. Like I I wake up still four years into it excited to go to work so and what does all of this work teach us about transformation or about redefining ourselves um i think yeah so from the student perspective uh, for example students is coming out of high school um maybe they're in a high school that's near their neighborhood and maybe they've only lived in they've lived in that neighborhood most of their life and interacted with the same students the same demographic same people and then they come here and they've got uh, classmates from Severna Park, Baltimore, D.C., Prince George County, Annapolis, Glen Burnie, like from all kinds of different areas. And it can be, I think, maybe a little overwhelming. And sometimes students just might stay in their shell um, because it can be overwhelming and stay just with, with their comfort zone. Um, I love my classes that I teach because there's students in the developmental program from every from all different demographics and so they're they interact with each other and they start making friends with people and having conversations with people and caring about people who they might not have ever sort of crossed those boundaries just because they didn't know how to um, so you can actually I actually see them transform not only as individuals but in their writing because I'm privileged to read their writing so I'm able to see them just sort of transform their, not just train of thoughts, but their identities. Um, I had a student who, she's transferring away next semester and where she started from um, and all the, the things that happened to her at the beginning. And just to see the fact that she came from this kind of scared inner city DC um, student whose um, father was got arrested and incarcerated, moved in with her grandmother, and her grandmother passed away, and then she was kind of homeless. We were able to find her a place to live. Um, she stayed in school. She's an A student. Wow. She made huh. best friends at, at, on this campus mm -hmm. in these classes through the Bridge Program, through SASP, and through um, her courses. And now she's transferring back to D.C. as a criminal justice transfer study major. Wow. And you could just see her confidence and her sort of reaffiliation with life just transform. When we talk to and get to know people who are different from us, Forrest says we learn from each other's experiences. We make lasting connections. We build trust and community. We can redefine who we are. Which brings us back to Kevin. Let's return to his story and hear how his newfound confidence and nerd, never ever realized defeat philosophy, has served him. Talk to me a little more about some of the challenges you faced. So many students, it's not even the academic, it's things that are happening outside of school. So you've faced a few of those yourself. Another struggle that I faced was actually transporting to Anne Arundel Community College. I live all the way in Laurel. Which and is a good distance from here. Yeah, it's uh, depending on traffic, it could be 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. It killed my wallet for certainty. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would take classes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I would Uber. And my Ubers, depending on the time of day it was, 
it would be from 35 to 45 dollars to go and to come back wow and that three days a week yeah it's a lot but the biggest one that i had hit, got hit with this year it was around april where my mom just went outside and lifted her arm to raise the trunk of her car and she said that she could not put her arm back down hmm. and at that time i didn't register i was just like oh she just it just got, it just froze for a second hmm. and then she forced it down and then she said she went to the bathroom and she could not pick up her arm she it was hurting she was crying she didn't know what to do and she literally she was just like it's probably just like dislocated that's it but later my mom kept on for over the course of a month still working two jobs wow and she said i can't take the pain i need to go see someone we uh she scheduled an appointment and the doctor said that you tore your rotator cuff ouch and so my mom she she went two weeks without working and then she had her surgery on june 12th everything went great we thought it was going to be uphill from there she just had to heal but the issue was like she had um anesthesia and not only that she had a um a nerve block the doctor said once that block ends and everything starts wearing down she was going to be in excruciating pain and we were like but i was like my mom can take pain don't worry about that she worked on that rotator cuff for a month she she can handle pain she got her surgery on wednesday Thursday night, she was crying. She literally could not take the pain. She was crying. She was like, why did I do this? Hmm. Questioning why she got the, uh, the mm -hmm. surgery. And I started crying right next to her, and I was like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, it's hard seeing someone you love so much, particularly someone who sounds like so strong, really yes. modeled for you strength and per perseverance. Hard to see them in pain. When people ask, who's my hero, I say my mom. And the reason I say my mom is not because it's a cliche. It's because I actually think my hero is my mom. My mom was my mom and my dad for years. Mm. And she still is up to this day. She has modeled for me what, how, how strong a woman can actually be. Mm -hmm. And I was like this, like, this is terrible. Seeing my hero find like basically seeing her with kryptonite right next to her yeah it destroyed me fall semester i tried to show like pure happiness to everyone and but try to be like try to be normal so often experiences that you're describing we then internalize and they become like voices in our head but you've continued to go forward and grow and, and build confidence do you find you have those voices in your head talking to you negatively? And if so, how do you keep them at bay? How do you handle that? Someone told me to give my the voices in my head a person. Hmm. Give them like a, literally how you would picture them. And I said that it's me. It's my own person telling me all these things. Not like some and evil dragon or something. No, nah. how I picture them is a person basically my whole my whole person just with red eyes and basically gray just telling me that i can't do things it's your evil that, twin yeah <laughs> and basically i can't do things and that look at your mom and you're doing this you're studying you're doing this you should be working helping her more your mom is like this and you're over here laughing you're over here supporting them when you should be supporting her and I would have this constantly beating at me and beating at me. And I was just like, I can't have this no more. Even though it tried to hold me back, I would always try to move forward mm -hmm. and move forward because all I get this, like, I call it stubbornness. That when someone says I can't do things, I try to do it. Because I used to back then when someone said I can't do things, I would be like, you're absolutely right. But now if someone says I can't do this, I'm like, watch me. You've really developed some new perspectives and philosophies. What skills have you gained most? The biggest one is confidence, and that's probably not a skill, but I would say for me that that is technically for me it is a skill. But I would say communication skills, leadership skills. Biggest one of all is organization skills. It just helped me develop who I am today. Sounds like with your nerd philosophy you have adopted a yes mentality yeah. you don't say no to anything yeah so you're really stretching yourself yeah the college 
holds what they call convocation, where it brings all the faculty and staff together before the start of the term. At the fall term, you said yes yeah. to an invitation to speak in front of approximately, what, 800 or more people? Yes. What was that like? <sighs> So that that was rigorous. That that it was just an amazing experience, being able to speak in front of the college that you love so much, all the faculty and staff, everyone that basically helped you grow. So not only it was was it only to like basically show who I was, but it was basically showing that everyone that has helped me this way, as well as my mom and my sister were in attendance, is basically showing everyone that look who I've become. I now come from a college that helped me know that community college is the start of brand new beginnings. I now come from a community college that has shown me that no matter the past, a brighter future will emerge. I now come from a community that not only believes in me, but has made me believe in myself as well. If I recall, you got a standing O for that. Yeah. How'd that feel? <sighs> I had I had to hold back tears. It, it was it was amazing. What about mom? Did she hold? But she was there, right? So yeah. Did she hold back tears? <sighs> my mom was crying. <laughs> my mom, my sister, every like everyone that I knew was crying. Even I had a um, I had a message from my email from my professor saying I'm so proud of you, and it was just it, it was just an amazing experience. That's fantastic. <laughs> it was powerful. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Really great. For convocation, you got some good coaching and support beforehand from one of your faculty. Uh, yeah, Professor Forrest Kasky, amazing professor. Just absolutely love him. He uh, show, he helped me improve my reading, and he was the reason a lot of the uh, things I'm involved in now, actually, uh, because of him, I joined the Student Achievement Success Program. Okay. And he was just like, you should join this program everything basically he just pitches my name in and <laughs> i just say yes i just like because i trust him because anything that he gives me or like wants me to do is for my it's basically to get my name out there or just to improve my communication skills and with him it's like he's just an incredible person like i wrote uh, i wrote a story like basically my whole life story and the first person that I wanted it to uh, someone to read it was him. Oh, I wanted powerful. him to I wanted him to read it. He told me it was amazing, and that's where I think he got the idea f to make me talk at convocation. So obviously, you've changed quite a bit. How would you describe that you have redefined yourself? From going from a very quiet person to a very shy person, and someone that didn't believe in themselves at all, to someone that literally has said yes to almost everything thrown at him, taking every opportunity possible and taking roles in leadership in different programs is just how I found it, is that I redefined myself, just saying, being able to be confident in my ability to speak, to lead is just, I look back at it and it's, it still warms my heart every time I think about it. That's great. You said every student's different, so obviously you give different advice to different students, but do you find that you have some general advice that you offer your fellow students? Yeah, um, the, one, the one piece of advice that I would always give students is that being able to find your voice takes you a long way, and sharing your story is worth it, that you never know where you might be heard or who might be listening. Share a conversation and you will see different perspectives. You will see that maybe what you feel is a hard time might be an easy time for someone else and it makes you value what you're going through a little bit more. What I've noticed that a simple hello can even change someone. Never ever realize defeat. There's a difference between failure and defeat. It's an important distinction because sometimes we do fail. We miss the goal, we burn our toast, we bomb an exam. 
Failure doesn't feel good, but it happens, and as we've heard in past episodes, we often learn the greatest lessons from our losses. Defeat is different. When we feel defeated, we've been beaten or overcome. We despair, and sometimes we give up. So when Kevin says nerd, you might hear, don't lose hope, keep going, persist with confidence. That's not always easy to do. Life can be hard, but it's easier if we're part of a supportive community, when we have people who believe in us. We can build that safe place, even in an angry world, by nurturing our connections, listening to the experiences of others, and expanding the boundaries of what we know. A simple hello can change someone and be the first glimpse of a brighter future. Redefine You is a production of Anne Arundel Community College. Our executive producer is Allison Baumbush, our producer is Jeremiah Pravat, and our writer, Amy Carr Willard. Others who helped with this podcast include Angie Hamlet, Alicia Renahan, and Ben Pierce. Special thanks to Kevin Lemus and Forrest Kasky. Find show notes, how to subscribe, and other extras on our website, aacc.edu slash podcast. I'm your host and creator of this podcast, Dan Baum. Thanks for listening. Uh, coffee?